This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Bechere of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Chapter 33 in which is related the novel of the ill-advised curiosity in florence a rich and famous city of italy in the province called tuscany there lived two gentlemen of wealth and quality anselmo and lothario such great friends that by way of distinction they were called by all that knew them the two friends they were unmarried young of the same age and of the same tastes which was enough to account for the reciprocal friendship between them Anselmo, it is true, was sometimes more inclined to seek pleasure in love than Lothario, for whom the pleasures of the chase had more attraction, but on occasion Anselmo would forego his own tastes to yield to those of Lothario, and Lothario would surrender his to fall in with those of Anselmo, and in this way their inclinations kept pace, one with the other with a concord so perfect that the best regulated clock could not surpass it. Anselmo was deep in love with a high-born and beautiful maiden of the same city, the daughter of Perrin so estimable, and so estimable herself, that he resolved, with the reproval of his friend Lothario, without whom he did nothing, to ask her of them in marriage, and did so, Lothario being the bearer of the demand, and conducting the negotiation so much to the satisfaction of his friend, that in a short time he was in possession of the object of his desires, and Camilla, so happy in having won Anselmo for her husband, that she gave unceasingly thanks to heaven and to Lothario, by whose means such good fortune had fallen her the first few days those of a wedding being usually days of merry-making lothario frequented his friend anselmo's house as he had been wont striving to do honour to him and to the occasion and to gratify him in every way he could but when the wedding days were over and the succession of visits and congratulations had slackened he began purposely to leave off going to the house of anselmo for it seemed to him as it naturally would to all men of sense that friends houses ought not to be visited after a marriage with the same frequency as in their master's bachelor days, because, though true and genuine friendship cannot and should not be in any way suspicious, still a married man's honour is a thing of such delicacy that it is held liable to injury from brothers, much more from friends, and Samo remarked the sensation of Lothario's visits and complained of it to him, saying that if he had known that marriage was to keep him from enjoying his society as he used he would have never married if by the thorough harmony that subsisted between them while he was a bachelor they had earned such a sweet name as that of the two friends he should not allow a title so rare and so delightful to be lost through a needless anxiety to act circumspectly and so he entreated him if such a phrase was allowable between them to be once more master of his house and to, and to come in and go out as formerly assuring him that his wife camilla had no other desire or inclination than that which you would wish her to have and that knowing how sincerely they loved one another she was grieved to see such coldness in him to all this and much more that anselmo said to lothario to persuade him to come to his house as he had been in the habit of doing lothario replied with so much prudent sense and judgment that anselmo was satisfied of his friend's good intentions and it was agreed that on two days in the week and on holidays lothario should come to dine with him but though this arrangement was made between them lothario resolved to observe it no further than he considered to be in accordance with the honour of his friend whose good name was more to him than his own he said and justly that a married man upon whom heaven had bestowed a beautiful wife should consider as carefully what friends he brought to his house as what female friends his wife associated with for what cannot be done or arranged in the market-place and church at public festivals or at stations opportunities that husbands cannot always deny their wives may be easily managed in the house of the female friend or relative in whom most confidence is reposed lothario said too that every married man should have some friend who would point out to him any negligence he might be guilty of in his conduct for it will sometimes happen that owing to the deep affection the husband bears his wife either he does not caution her or not to vex her refrains from telling her to do or not to do certain things doing or avoiding which may be a matter of honour or reproach to him and errors of this kind he could easily correct if warned by a friend but where is such a friend to be found as lothario would have so judicious so loyal and so true of a truth i know not lothario alone was such a one for with the utmost care and vigilance he watched over the honour of his friend and strove to diminish 
cut down and reduce the number of days for going to his house according to their agreement, lest the visits of a young man, wealthy, high-born, and with the attractions he was conscious of possessing, at the house of a woman so beautiful as Camilla, should be regarded with suspicion by the inquisitive and malicious eyes of the idle public. For though his integrity and reputation might bridle slanderous tongues, still he was unwilling to hazard either his own good name or that of his friend, and for this reason most of the days agreed upon he devoted to some other business which he pretended was unavoidable, so that a great portion of the day was taken up with complaints on one side and excuses on the other. It happened, however, that on one occasion, when the two were strolling together outside the city, Anselmo addressed the following words to Lothario. "'Thou mayest suppose, Lothario, my friend, that I am unable to give sufficient thanks for the favours God has rendered me in making me the son of such parents as mine were, and bestowing upon me with no niggard hand what are called the gifts of nature, as well as those of fortune, and above all for what he has done in giving me thee for a friend and Camilla for a wife, two treasures that I value, if not as highly as I ought, at least as highly as I am able. And yet, with all these good things, which are commonly all that men need to enable them to live happily, I am the most discontented and dissatisfied man in the whole world, for I know not how long since I have been harassed and oppressed by a desire so strange and so unusual, that I wonder at myself and blame and chide myself when I am alone, and strive to stifle it and hide it from my own thoughts, and with no better success than if I were endeavouring deliberately to publish it to all the world, and as if, in short, it must come out. I would confide it to thy safekeeping, feeling sure that by this means, and by thy readiness as a true friend to afford me relief, I shall soon find myself freed from the distress it causes me, and that thy care will give me happiness in the same degree as my own folly has caused me misery. The words of Anselmo struck Lothario with astonishment, unable as he was to conjecture the purport of such a lengthy preamble, and though he strove to imagine what desire it could be that so troubled his friend, his conjectures were all far from the truth, and to relieve the anxiety with this perplexity was causing him, he told him he was doing a flagrant injustice to their friendship, in seeking circuitous methods of confiding to him his most hidden thoughts, for he well knew he might reckon upon his counsel in diverting them, or his help in carrying them into effect. "'That is the truth,' replied Anselmo. And replying upon that I will tell thee, friend Lothario, that the desire which harasses me is that of knowing whether my wife Camilla is as good and as perfect as I think her to be, and I cannot satisfy myself of the truth of this point except by testing her in such a way that the trial may prove the purity of her virtue, as the fire proves that of gold, because I am persuaded, my friend, that a woman is virtuous only in proportion as she is or is not tempted, and that if she alone is strong who does not yield to the promises, gifts, tears, and importunities of earnest lovers, for what thanks does a woman deserve for being good if no one urges her to be bad? And what wonder is it that she is reserved and circumspect to whom no opportunity is given of doing wrong, and who knows that she has a husband that will take her life the first time he detects her in impropriety? I do not, therefore, hold her who is virtuous through fear or want of opportunity, in the same estimation as her who comes out of temptation and trial with a crown of victory. And so, for these reasons, and many others, I could give thee to justify and support the opinion I hold. I am desirous that my wife Camilla should pass this crisis, and be refined and tested by the fire of finding herself wooed, and by one worthy to set his affections upon her. And if she comes out, as I know she will, victorious from the struggle, I shall look upon my good fortune as unequalled. I shall be able to say that the cup of my desire is full, and that the virtuous woman of whom the sage says— who shall find her, has fallen to my lot. And if the result be to the contrary of what I expect, in the satisfaction of knowing that I have been right in my opinion, I shall bear without complaint the pain which my so dearly bought experience will naturally cause me. And as nothing of all thou wilt urge in opposition to my wish will avail to keep me from carrying it into effect, it is my desire, friend Lothario, that thou shouldst consent to become the instrument for effecting this purpose that I am bent upon, for I will afford the opportunities to that end, and nothing shall be wanting, that I may think necessary for the pursuit of a virtuous, honourable, modest, and high-minded woman. And among other reasons I am induced to entrust this arduous task to thee by the consideration that if Camilla be conquered by thee, the conquest will not be pushed to extremes, but only far enough to account that accomplished which from a sense of honour will be left undone. 
Thus I shall not be wronged in anything more than intention, and my wrong will remain buried in the integrity of thy silence, which I know well will be lasting as that of death in what concerns me. If, therefore, thou wouldst have me enjoy what can be called life, thou wilt at once engage in this love-struggle, not lukewarmly nor slothfully, but with the energy and zeal that my desire demands, and with the loyalty our friendship assures me of. Such were the words Anselmo addressed to Lothario, who listened to them with such attention that, except to say what has already been mentioned, he did not open his lips until the other had finished. Then, perceiving that he had no more to say, after regarding him for a while, as one would regard something never before seen that excited wonder and amazement, he said to him, "'I cannot persuade myself, Anselmo, my friend, that what thou hast said to me is not in jest. If I thought that thou were speaking seriously, I would not have allowed thee to go so far, so as to put a stop to thy long harangue by not listening to thee. I verily suspect that either thou dost not know me, or I do not know thee.' But no, I know well thou art Anselmo, and thou knowest that I am Lothario. The misfortune is, it seems to me, that thou art not the Anselmo thou wert, and must have thought that I am not the Lothario I should be, for the things thou hast said to me are not those of that Anselmo who was my friend, nor are those that thou demandest of me what should be asked of the Lothario thou knowest. True friends will prove their friends, and make use of them, as it as a poet has said, Oscadaris, whereby he meant that they will not make use of their friendship in things that are contrary to God's will. If this, then, was a heathen's feeling about friendship, how much more should it be a Christian's? Who knows that the divine may not be forfeited for the sake of any human friendship? And if a friend should go so far as to put aside his duty to heaven to fulfill his duty to his friend, it should not be in matters that are trifling or of little moment— but in such as affect the friend's life and honour. Now tell me, Anselmo, in which of these two art thou impelled, that I should hazard myself to gratify thee, and do a thing so detestable as that thou seekest of me? Neither forsooth, on the contrary, what thou dost ask of me, so far as I understand, to strive and labour to rob thee of honour and life, and rob myself of them at the same time? For if I take away thy honour, it is plain I take away thy life as a man without honour is worse than dead, and being the instrument, as thou wilt have it so, of so much wrong to thee, shall not I too be left without honour, and consequently without life? Listen to me, Anselmo, my friend, and be not impatient to answer me until I have said what occurs to me touching the object of thy desire, for there will be time enough for thee to reply and for me to hear. Be it so, said Anselmo, say what thou wilt. Lothario then went on to say, it seems to me, Anselmo, that thine is just now the temper of mind which is always that of the Moors, who can never be brought to see the error of their creed by quotations from the Holy Scriptures, or by reasons which depend upon the examination of the understanding, or are founded upon the articles of faith, but must be examples that are palpable, easy, intelligible, capable of proof, not admitting of doubt, with mathematical demonstrations that cannot be denied like if equals be taken from equals, the remainders are equal, and if they do not understand this in words, and indeed they do not, it has to be shown to them with the hands, and put before their eyes, and even with all this, no one succeeds in convincing them of the truth of our holy religion. The same mode of proceeding I shall have to adopt with thee. The desire which has sprung up in thee is so absurd and remote from everything that is a semblance of reason, that I feel it would be a waste of time to employ it in reasoning with thy simplicity." For at present I will call it by no other name, and I am tempted to leave thee in folly as a punishment for thy pernicious desire, but the friendship I bear thee, which will not allow me to desert thee in such manifest danger of destruction, keeps me from dealing so harshly by thee, and that thou mayst clearly see this, say, Anselmo, hast thou not told me that I must force my suit upon a modest woman, decoy one that is virtuous, make overtures to one that is pure-minded, pay court, to one that is prudent? Yes, thou hast told me so. Then, if thou knowest thou hast a wife, virtu modest, virtuous, pure-minded, and prudent, what is it that thou seekest? And if thou believes that she will come forth victorious from all my attacks, as a doubtless she would, what higher titles than those she possesses now dost thou think 
thou canst upon her then, or in what will she be better than she is now? Either that either thou dost not hold her to be what thou sayest, or thou knowest not what thou dost demand. If thou dost not hold her to be what thou sayest, why dost thou seek to prove her instead of treating her as guilty in the way that may seem best to thee? But if she be as virtuous as thou dost believest, and it is an unca- it is an uncalled for proceeding to make trial of truth itself, for after trial it will be in the same estimation as before. Thus, then, it is conclusive that to attempt things from which harm rather than advantage may come it, to us is the part of unreasoning and reckless minds, especially when they are things which are not forced or compelled to attempt, and which show from afar that it is plainly madness to attempt them. Difficulties are attempted either for the sake of God or for the sake of the world, or for both. Those undertaken for God's sakes are those which the saints undertake when they attempt to live the lives of angels in human bodies. Those undertaken for the sake of the world are those of men who traverse such a vast empire of water, such a variety of climate, so many strange countries, to acquire what are called the blessings of fortune, and those undertaken for the sake of God and the world together are those of brave soldiers who no sooner do they see in the enemy's wall a breach as wide as a cannonball can make than, casting aside all fear, without hesitation or heeding, the manifest peril that threatens them, borne onward by the desire of defending their faith, their country, and their king, they fling themselves dauntlessly into the midst of a thousand opposing deaths that await them. Such are the things that men are wont to attempt, and there is honor, glory, gain in attempting them, however full of difficulty and peril they may be. But that which thou sayest it is thy wish to attempt and carry out will not win thee the glory of God, nor the blessings of fortune, nor fame among men. For even if the issue be as thou wouldst have it, thou wilt be no happier, richer, or more honored than thou art this moment. And if it be otherwise, thou wilt be reduced to misery greater than can be imagined. For then it will avail thee nothing to reflect that no one is aware of thy misfortune that has befallen thee. It will suffice to torture and crush thee that thou knowest it thyself, and in confirmation of the truth of what I say, let me repeat to thee a stanza made by the famous poet Luigi Tensilo at the end of the first part of his Tears of St. Peter, which says thus, The anguish and the shame but grew greater in Peter's heart as morning slowly came. No eye was there to see him. Well he knew, yet he himself was to himself a shame, exposed to all men's gaze or screened from view. A noble heart will feel the paying the same. I pray to shame the sinning soul will be, though none but heaven and earth its shame can see. And thus by keeping it secret thou wilt not escape thy sorrow, but rather thou wilt shed tears unceasingly, if not tears of the eyes, tears of blood from the heart, like those shed by that simple doctor our poet tells us of, that are I the test of the cup, which the wise Ronaldo, better advised, refused to do, for though this may be a poetic fiction, it contains a moral lesson worthy of attention and study and imitation. Moreover, by what I am about to say to thee, thou wilt be led to see the great error thou wouldst commit. Tell me, Anselmo, if heaven or good fortune had made thee master and lawful owner of a diamond of the finest quality, with the excellence and purity of which all the lapidaries that had been seen it had been satisfied, saying with one voice and common consent that in purity, quality, and fineness, it was all that a stone of the kind could possibly be. Thou thyself, too, being of the same belief, as knowing nothing could be to the contrary, would it be reasonable in thee to desire to take that diamond and place it between an anvil and a hammer, and by mere force of blows and strength of arm try it, if it were as hard and as fine as they said? And if thou didst, and if the stone should resist so silly a test, that would add nothing to its value or reputation, and if it were broken, as it might be, would not all be lost? Undoubtedly it would, leaving its owner to be rated as a fool in the opinion of all. Consider, then, Anselmo, my friend, that Camilla is a diamond of the finest quality, as well in thy estimation in that of, as in that of others, and that it is contrary to reason to expose her to the risk of being broken. For if she remains intact, she cannot rise to a higher value than she now possesses, and if she give way and be unable to resist, bethink thee now that thou wilt be deprived of her, and with what good reason thou wilt complain of thyself for having been the cause of her ruin and thine own. Remember, there is no jewel in the world so precious as a chaste and virtuous woman, and that the whole honour of woman consists in reputation. And since thy wife is of that high excellence that thou knowest, wherefore shouldst thou seek to call that truth in question? 
"'Remember, my friend, that a woman is an imperfect animal, "'and that impediments are not to be placed in her way "'to make her trip and fall, "'but that they should be removed and her path left clear of all obstacles, "'so that without hindrance she may run her course freely "'to attain the desired perfection, which consists in being virtuous. "'Naturalists tell us that the ermine is a little animal "'which is a fur, fur of purest white, "'and that when the hunters wish to take it, "'they make use of this artifice. "'Having ascertained the places which it frequents and passes, "'they stop the way to them with mud, "'and then, rousing it, drive it towards the spot, "'and as soon as the ermine comes in the mud, "'it halts and allows itself to be taken captive "'rather than pass through the mire "'and spoil and sully its whiteness, "'which values more than life and liberty. "'The virtuous and chaste woman is an ermine, "'and whiter and purer than snow is the virtue of modesty.' and he who wishes her not to lose it, but to keep and preserve it, must adopt a course different from that employed with the ermine. He must not put her before the mire of the gifts and attentions of persevering lovers, because perhaps, and even without a perhaps, she may not have sufficient virtue and natural strength in herself to pass through and tread underfoot these impediments. They must be removed, and the, and the brightness of virtue and the beauty of a fair fame must be put before her. A virtuous woman, too, is like a mirror of clear shining crystal, liable to be tarnished and dimmed by every breath that touches it she must be treated as relics are adored not touched she must be protected and prized as one protects and prizes a fair garden full of roses and flowers the owner of which allows no one to trespass or pluck a blossom even for others that from afar and through the iron grating they may enjoy its fragrance and its beauty finally let me repeat to thee some verses that come to my mind I hear them in a modern comedy, and it seems to me they bear upon the point we are discussing. A prudent old man was giving advice to another, the father of a young girl, to lock her up, watch over her, and keep her in seclusion, and among other arguments he used this. A woman is a thing of glass, but her brittleness tis best not too curiously to test. Who knows what may come to pass? Breaking is an easy matter, and it's folly to expose. What you cannot mend to blows, what you can't make whole to shatter— this then all may hold is true, and that the reason's plain to see, for if days there be, there are golden showers too. And that I have said to thee so far, Anselmo, has had reference to what concerns thee. Now it is right that I should say something of what regards myself, and if I be prolix, pardon me, for the labyrinth into which thou hast answered, and from which thou wouldst have me extricate thee, makes it necessary. Thou dost reckon me thy friend, and thou wouldst rob me of honour, a thing wholly inconsistent with friendship. And not only dost thou aim at this, and thou wouldst have me rob thee of it also. That thou wouldst rob me of it is clear, for when Camilla sees that I pay court to her as thou requirest, she will certainly regard me as a man without honour or right feeling, since I attempt to do a thing so much opposed to what I owe to my position and thy friendship. That thou wouldst have me rob thee of it is beyond a doubt, for Camilla, seeing that I press my suit upon her, will suppose that I perceive something in her light that has encouraged me to make known to her my base desire and she holds herself dishonoured, her dishonour touches thee as belonging to her, and hence arises what so commonly takes place, that the husband of the adulterous woman, though he may not be aware of or have given any cause for his wife's failure in duty, or being careless and negligent, have had in his power to prevent her dishonour, nevertheless is stigmatised by a vile and reproachful name, and in a manner regarded with eyes of contempt instead of pity by all who know of his wife's guilt, though they see that he is unfortunate not by a no by his own fault, but by the lust of a vicious consort. But I will tell thee why, with good reason, dishonour attaches to the husband of the unchaste wife. Though he know not that she is so, nor be to blame, nor have anything done, or given any provocation to make her so, and be not weary listening to me, for it will be for thy good. When God created our first parent in the earthly paradise, the holy scripture says that he infused sleep into Adam, and while he slept took a rib from his left side, which he formed our mother Eve, and when Adam awoke and beheld her, he said, This is flesh of my flesh, and bone of my bone. And God said, For this shall man leave his father and his mother, and they shall be two in one flesh. And then was instituted the divine sacrament of marriage, which such ties that death alone can loose them. And such is the force and virtue of this miraculous sacrament, that it makes two different persons one, and the same flesh, and even more than this, when the virtuous are married. For though they have come two souls, they have but one will. And hence it follows that as the flesh of the wife is one, and the same with that of her husband, the stains that may come upon it, 
for the injuries it incurs fall upon the husband's flesh, though he, as has been said, may have given no cause for them, for as the pain of the foot or any member of the body is felt by the whole body, because all is one flesh, as the head feels the hurt to the ankle without having caused it, so the husband, being one with her, shares the dishonour of its wife, and as all worldly honour or dishonour comes of flesh and blood, and the erring wife's is of that kind, the husband must needs bear his part of it, and be held dishonourable without knowing it. See then, Anselmo, that the peril thou art encountering, and seeking to disturb the peace of thy virtuous concert, see for what an empty and ill-advised curiosity thou wouldst rouse up passions that now repose in quiet in the breast of thy chaste wife. Reflect that what thou art staking all to win is little, and what thou wilt lose is so much that I leave it undescribed, not having the words to express it. But if all I have said be not enough to turn thee from thy vile purpose, thou must seek some other instrument for thy dishonour and misfortune, for such I will not consent to be. Though I lose thy friendship, the greatest loss that I can conceive. Having said this, the wise and virtuous Lothario was silent, and Anselmo, troubled in mind and deep in thought, was unable for a while to utter a word in reply. But at length, he said, I have listened, Lothario, my friend, attentively, as thou hast seen, to what thou hast chosen to say to me, and in thy arguments, examples, and comparisons, I have seen that high intelligence thou dost possess, and the perfection of true friendship thou hast reached. And likewise I see and confess that I am not guided by the opinion, but follow my own. I am flying from the good and pursuing the evil. This being so, thou must remember that I am now laboring under that infirmity which women sometimes suffer from, when the craving seizes them to eat clay, plaster, charcoal, and even things worse, disgusting to look at, much more to eat, so that it will be necessary to have recourse to some artifice to cure me. And this can easily be effected if only thou wilt make a beginning, and even though it be in a lukewarm and make-believe fashion to pay court to Camilla, who will not be so yielding that her virtue will give way at the first attack, with this mere attempt I shall rest satisfied, and thou wilt have done what our friendship binds thee to do, not only in giving me life, but in persuading me not to discard my honour. And this thou art bound to do for one reason alone, that being, as I am resolved to apply this test, it is not for thee to permit me to reveal my weakness to another, and so imperil that honour thou art striving to keep me from losing. And if thine may not stand as high as it ought in the estimation of Camilla while thou art paying court to her, this is of little or no importance, because ere long, on finding in her that constancy which we expect, thou canst tell her the plain truth as regards our stratagem, and so regain thy place in her esteem. And as thou art venturing so little, and by the venture canst afford me so much satisfaction, refuse not to undertake it, even if further difficulties present themselves to thee. For, as I have said, if thou wilt only make a beginning, I will acknowledge the issue decided. Lothario, seeing the fixed determination of Anselmo, and not knowing what further examples to offer or arguments to urge in order to dissuade him from it, and perceiving that he threatened to confide his pernicious scheme to someone else, to avoid a greater evil, resolved to gratify him and do what he asked, intending to manage the business so as to satisfy Anselmo without corrupting the mind of Camilla. So in reply he told him not to communicate his purpose to any other, for he would undertake the task himself, and would begin it as soon as he pleased. Anselmo embraced him warmly and affectionately, and thanked him for his offer, as if he had bestowed some great favour upon him, and it was agreed between them to set about it the next day, Anselmo affording opportunity and time to Lothario to converse alone with Camilla, and furnishing him with money and jewels to offer and present to her. He suggested, too, that he should treat her to music and write verses in her praise, and if he was unwilling to take the trouble of composing them, he offered to do it himself. Lothario agreed to all with an intention very different from what Anselmo had supposed, and with this understanding they returned to Anselmo's house, where they found Camilla awaiting her husband anxiously and uneasily, for he was later than usual in returning that day. Lothario repaired to his own house, and Anselmo remained in his, as well satisfied as Lothario was troubled in mind, for he could see no satisfactory way out of this ill-advised business. That night, however, he thought of a plan by which he might deceive Anselmo without any injury to Camilla. The next day he went to dine with his friend, and was welcomed by Camilla, who received and treated him with great cordiality, knowing the affection her husband felt for him. When dinner was over, and the cloth removed, Anselmo told Lothario to stay there with Camilla while he attended to some pressing business, and he would return in an hour and a half. 
Camilla begged him not to go, and Lothario offered to accompany him, but nothing could persuade Anselmo, who, on the contrary, pressed Lothario to remain waiting for him, as he had a matter of great importance to discuss with him. At the same time, he bade Camilla not to leave Lothario alone until he came back. In short, he contrived to put so good a face on the reason, or the folly, of his absence, that no one could have suspected it was a pretense. Anselmo took his departure, and Camilla and Lothario were left alone at the table, for the rest of the household had gone to dinner. Lothario saw himself in the lists according to his friend's wish, and facing an enemy that could by her beauty alone vanquish a squadron of armed knight, judge whether he had good reason to fear. But what he did was to lean his elbow on the arm of the chair and his cheek upon his hand, and, asking Camilla's pardon for his ill manners, he said he wished to take a little sleep until Anselmo returned. Camilla said in reply that he could repose more at ease in the reception room than his chair, and begged of him to go and sleep there, but Lothario declined, and there he remained asleep until the return of Anselma, who, finding Camilla in her own room and Lothario asleep, imagined that he had stayed away so long as to have afforded them time enough for conversation, and even for sleep, and was all impatience until Lothario should wake up, that he might go out with him and question him as to his success. Everything fell out as he wished. Lothario awoke, and the two at once left the house, and Anselmo asked what he was anxious to know, and Lothario in answer told him that he had not thought it advisable to declare himself entirely the first time, and therefore had only extolled the charms of Camilla, telling her that all the city spoke of nothing else but her beauty and wit, for this seemed to him an excellent way of beginning to gain her good will and render her disposed to listen to him with pleasure the next time thus availing himself of the device the devil has recourse to when he would deceive one who is on the watch, for he being an angel of darkness transforms himself into an angel of light, and, under cover of a fair seeming, discloses himself at length, and affects his purpose, if at the beginning his wiles are not discovered. All this gave great satisfaction to Anselmo, and he said he would afford the same opportunity every day but without leaving the house, for he would find things to do at home, so that Camilla should not detect the plot. Thus, then, several days went by, and Lothario, without uttering a word to Camilla, reported to Anselmo that he had talked with her, and that he had never been able to draw from her the slightest indication of consent to anything dishonorable, nor even a sign or shadow of hope. On the contrary, he said she would inform her husband of it. So far, well, Camilla has thus resisted words. We must now see how she will resist deeds. I give you to-morrow two thousand crowns in gold for you to offer her, or even present, and as many more to buy jewels to lure her, for women are fond of being becomingly attired and going gaily dressed, and all the more so if they are beautiful, however chaste they may be. And if she resists this temptation, I will rest satisfied, and I will give you no more trouble. Hotharia replied that now he had begun, he would carry out the undertaking to the end, though he perceived he was to come out of it wearied and vanquished. The next day he received the four thousand crowns, and with them four thousand perplexities, for he knew not what to say by way of a new falsehood, but in the end he made up his mind to tell Camilla that Camilla stood firm against the gifts and promises as against words, and that there was no use in taking any further trouble, for the time was all spent to no purpose. But chance, detecting things in a different manner, so ordered it that Anselmo, having left Lothario and Camilla alone as on other occasions, shut himself into a chamber, and posted himself to watch and listen through the keyhole, to what passed between them, and perceived that for more than half an hour Lothario did not utter a word to Camilla, nor would utter a word though he were to be there for an age, and he came to the conclusion that what his friend had told him about the replies of Camilla was all invention and falsehood, and to ascertain if it were so, he came out, and calling Lothario aside, asked him what news he had, and in what humour Camilla was. Lothario replied that he was not disposed to go on the business— for she had answered him so angrily and harshly that he had not heart to say anything more to her. "'Ah, oh, Lothario, Lothario,' said Anselmo, "'how ill dost thou meet thy obligations to me, and the great confidence I repose in thee! I have been just now watching through this keyhole, and I have seen that thou hast not said a word to Camilla, once I conclude that on the former occasion thou hast not spoken to her either. And if this be so, as no doubt it is, why dost thou deceive me, or wherefore seekest thou by craft to deprive me of the means I find of detaining my desire?' Anselmo said no more. But he said enough to cover Lothario with shame and confusion, and he, feeling as if it were his honour touched by, having been detected in a lie, swore to Anselmo that he would from that moment devote himself to satisfying him without any deception, as he would see if he had the curiosity to watch, though he need not take the trouble, for the pains he would take to satisfy him would remove all suspicions from his mind. Anselmo believed him, and to afford him opportunity more free and less liable to surprise, he resolved to absent himself from his house for eight days, betaking himself to that of a friend, 
of his who lived in a village not far from the city, and, the better to account for his departure to Camilla, he so arranged it that his friend should send him a very pressing invitation. Unhappy, short-sighted Anselmo, what art thou doing, what art thou plotting, what art thou devising? Bethink thee, thou art working against thyself, plotting thine own dishonour, devising thy own ruin. Thy wife Camilla is virtuous, thou dost possess her in peace and quietness, no one assails thy happiness. Her thoughts wander not beyond the walls of thy house, thou art her heaven on earth, the object of her wishes, the fulfilment of her desires, the measure wherewith she mothers her will, making it conform in all things to thine and heaven's. If, then, the mind of her honour, beauty, virtue, and modesty yields thee without labour, all the wealth it contains, and thou canst wish for, why wilt thou dig the earth in search of fresh veins, of new, unknown treasure, risking the collapse of all, since it but rests within the feeble probs of her weak nature? Bethink thee that from him who seeks impossibilities that which is possible may with justice be withheld, as was better expressed by a poet who said, "'Tis mine to seek for life and death. Health and disease seek I, I seek in prison freedom's breath, and traitor's loyalty. So faith that ever scorns to grant, or grace or boon to me, since what can never be I want, denies me what might be. The next day Anselmo took his departure for the village, leaving instructions with Camilla that, during his absence, Lothario would come to look after his house and to dine with her, and that she was to treat him as she would himself. Camilla was distressed, as a discreet and right-minded woman would be, at the orders her husband had left her, and bade him to remember that it was not becoming that any one should occupy his seat at the table during his absence, and if he acted thus from not feeling confidence that she would be able to manage his house, let him try her this time, and he would find by experience that she was equal to greater responsibilities. And Selma replied that it was his pleasure to have it so, and that she had only to submit and obey. Camilla said she would do so, though against her will. And Selma went, and the next day Lothario came to his house, where he was received by Camilla with a friendly and modest welcome. But she never suffered Lothario to see her alone, for she was always attended by men and woman servants, especially by a handmaid of hers. Leonella by name, to whom she was much attached, for they had been brought up together from childhood in her father's house, and whom she had kept with her after marriage with Anselmo. The first three days Lothario did not speak to her, though he might have done so when they removed the cloth and the servants retired to dine hastily, for such were Camilla's orders. Nay more, Leonella had directions to dine earlier than Camilla, and never to leave it for her side. She, however, Having her thoughts fixed upon other things more to her taste, and wanting that time and opportunity for her own pleasures, did not always obey her mistress's commands, but on the contrary left them alone, as if they had ordered her to do so. But the modest bearings of Camilla, the calmness of her countenance, the composure of her aspect, were enough to bridle the tongue of Lothario. But the influence which the many virtues of Camilla exerted in imposing silence on Lothario's tongue proved mischievous for both of them. For if his tongue was silent, his thoughts were busy, and could dwell at leisure upon the perfections of Camilla's goodness and beauty one by one, charms enough to warm with love a marble statue, not to say a heart, of flesh. Lothario gazed upon her when he might have been speaking to her, and thought how worthy of being loved she was, and thus reflection began, little by little, to assail his allegiance to Anselmo, and a thousand times he thought of withdrawing from the city and going where Anselmo should never see him, nor he see Camilla. But already the delight he found in gazing on her interposed and held him fast. He put a constraint upon himself and struggled to repel and repress the pleasure he found in contemplating Camilla. When alone he blamed himself for his weakness, called himself a bad friend, nay, a bad Christian, then he argued the matter and compared himself with Anselmo, always coming to the conclusion that the folly and rashness of Anselmo had been worse than his faithlessness, and that if he could excuse his intentions as easily before God as with man, he had no reason to fear any punishment for his offence. In short, the beauty and goodness of Camilla, joined with the opportunity which the blind husband had placed in his hands, overthrew the loyalty of Lothario, and giving heed to nothing save the object towards which his inclinations led him, after Anselmo had been three days absent, during which he had been carrying on a continual struggle with his passion, he began to make love to Camilla with so much vehemence and warmth of language that she was overwhelmed with amazement, and could only rise from her place and retire to her room without answering him a word. But the hope which always springs up with love was not weakened in Lothario by the repelling demeanour. On the contrary, his passion for Camilla increased, and she discovering in him what she had never expected, knew not what to do, and considering it neither safe nor right to give him the chance or opportunity of speaking to her again, she resolved to send, as she did that very night, one of her servants with a letter to Anselmo, in which she addressed the following words to him. End of chapter 33.
LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Bashar of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. Don Quixote, Volume 1, by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra. Translated by John Ormsby. Chapter 34 through 35. Chapter thirty four, in which is continued the novel of the ill advised curiosity. It is commonly said that an army looks ill without its general, and a castle without its castellan, and I say that a young married woman looks still worse without her husband, unless there are very good reasons for it. I find myself so ill at ease without you, and so incapable of enduring the separation, that unless you return quickly, I shall have to go for relief to my parents' house, even if I leave yours without a protector. For the one you left me, if indeed he deserves that title, has, I think, more regard for his own pleasure than to what concerns you. As you are possessed of discernment, I need say no more to you, nor indeed is it fitting I should say more. And Selma received his letter, and from it he gathered that Lothario had be already begun his task, and that Camilla must have replied to him as he would have wished. And delighted beyond measure at such intelligence, he sent word to her not to leave his house on any account, as he would return very shortly. Camilla was astonished at Anselmo's reply, which placed her in greater perplexity than before, for she never dared to remain in her own house, nor yet to go to her parents, for in remaining her virtue was imperiled, and in going she was opposed to her husband's commands. Finally she decided upon what was worse, the worst course for her, to remain, resolving not to fly from the presence of Lothario, that she might not give food for gossip to her servants, and she now began to regret having written as she had to her husband fearing he might imagine that Lothario had perceived some lightness which he had impelled him to lay aside the respect he owed her. But confident of her rectitude, she put her trust in God and her, in her own virtuous intentions, with which she hoped to resist in silence all the solicitations of Lothario, without saying anything to her husband so as not to involve him in any quarrel or trouble. And she began to consider how to excuse Lothario to Anselmo when he should ask her what it was that induced her to write that letter. With these resolutions, more honourable than judicious or effectual, she remained the next day listening to Lothario, who pressed his suit so strenuously that Camilla's firmness began to waver, and their virtue had enough to do to come to the rescue of her eyes and keep them from showing signs of a certain tender compassion which the tears and appeals of Lothario had awakened in her bosom. Lothario observed all this, and it inflamed him all the more. In short, he felt that while Anselmo's absence afforded time and opportunity, he must press the siege of the fortress and so he assailed her self-esteem with praises of her beauty, for there is nothing that more quickly reduces and levels the castle towers of fair woman's vanity than vanity itself upon the tongue of flattery. In fact, with the utmost assiduity, he undermined the rock of her purity with such engines that had Camilla been a brass, she must have fallen. He wept, he entreated, he promised, he flattered, he importuned, he pretended with so much feeling and apparent sincerity that he overthrew the virtuous resolves of Camilla, and won the triumph he least expected and most longed for. Camilla yielded, Camilla fell, but what wonder if the friendship of Lothario could not stand firm, a clear proof to us that the passion of love is to be conquered only by flying from it, and that no one should engage in a struggle with an enemy so mighty, for divine strength is needed to overcome his human power. Leonella alone knew of her mistress's weakness, for the two false friends and new lovers were unable to conceal it. Lothario did not care to tell Camilla the object Anselmo had in view, nor that he had afforded him the opportunity of attaining such a result, lest she should undervalue his love and think that it was by chance and without intending it, and not of his own accord that he had made love to her. A few days earlier Anselmo returned to his house, and did not perceive what it had lost, that which he so lightly treated and so highly prized. He went at once to see Lothario and found him at home. They embraced each other, and Anselmo asked for tidings of his life or death. The tidings... I have to give thee, Anselmo, my friend, said Lothario, are that thou dost possess a wife that is worthy to be the pattern and crown of all good wives. The words that I have addressed to her were borne away on the winds, my promises have been despised, my presents have been refused, such vain tears as I shed have been turned into open ridicule, and short, as Camilla is the essence of all beauty, so she is the treasure-house where purity dwells, and gentleness and modesty abide, with all the virtues that can confer praise, honour, and happiness upon a woman. Take back thy money, my friend, here it is, and I have no need to touch it, for the chastity of Camilla leads, yields not to things so base as gifts or promises. Be content, Anselmo, and refrain from making further proof, and as thou hast passed dryshood through the sea of these doubts and suspicions that are and may be entertained of woman, 
seek not to plunge again into the deep ocean of new embarrassments or with another plot make trial of the goodness and strength of the bark that heaven has granted thee for thy passage across the sea of this world but reckon thyself now safe in port moor thyself with the anchor of sound reflection and rest in peace until thou art called upon to pay that debt which no nobility on earth can escape paying Anselmo was completely satisfied by the words of Lothario, and believed them as fully as if they had been spoken by an oracle. Nevertheless, he begged of him not to relinquish the undertaking, were it but for the sake of curiosity and amusement. Though thenceforward he need not make use of the same earnest endeavours as before, all he wished him to do was to write some verses to her, praising her under the name of Chloris, for he, thought, for he himself would give her to understand that he was in love with the lady for whom he had given the name to enable him to sing her praises with the decorum due to her modesty, and if Lothario were unwilling to take the trouble of writing the verses, he would compose them himself. That will not be necessary, said Lothario, for the muses are not such enemies of mine, but that they visit me now and then in the course of the year. Do thou tell Camilla what thou hast proposed about a pretended amour of mine. As for the verses, we'll make them, and if not as good as the subject deserves, they shall be at least the best I can produce. An agreement to this effect was made between the friends, the ill-advised one and the treacherous, and Anselmo, returning to his house, asked Camilla the question she already wondered he had not asked before, what it was that caused her to write the letter she had sent him. Camilla replied that it had seemed to her that Lothario looked at her somewhat more freely than when he had been at home, but now she was undeceived and believed it to have been only her own imagination, for Lothario now avoided seeing her, or being alone with her. Anselmo told her that she might be quite easy on the score of that suspicion, for he knew that Lothario was in love with a damsel of rank in the city, whom he celebrated under the name of Chloris, and that, even if he were not, his fidelity and their great friendship left no room for fear. Had not Camilla, however, been informed beforehand by Lothario that his love for Chloris was a pretense, and that he himself had told Anselmo of it in order to be able sometimes to give utterance to the praises of Camilla herself, no doubt she would have fallen into despairing toils of jealousy, but, being forewarned, she received the startling news without uneasiness. The next day, as the three were at the table, Anselmo asked Lothario to recite something of what he had composed for his mistress Chloris, for as Camilla did not know her, he might safely say what he liked. "'Even did she know her,' returned Lothario, "'I would hide nothing, for when a lover praises this lady's beauty, and charges her with cruelty, he casts no imputation upon her fair name.' At any rate, all I can say is that yesterday I made a sonnet on the ingratitude of this chorus, which goes thus. At midnight, in the silence, when the eyes of happier mortals balmy slumbers close, the weary tale of my unnumbered woes to chorus and to heaven is wont to rise. And when the light of day, returning, dies, the portal of the east, with tints of rose, with undiminished force my sorrow flows in broken accents and in burning sighs. And when the sun ascends his star-girt throne, and on the earth pours down his midday beams, noon but renews my wailing and my tears, and with the night again goes up my moan. Yet ever in my agony it seems to me that neither heaven nor Chloris hears. The sonnet pleased Camilla, and still more Anselmo, for he praised it, and the lady was excessively cruel, who made no return for sincerity so manifest. On which Camilla said, Then all that love's mitten poets say is true. As poets, they do not tell the truth, replied Lothario, but as lovers, they are not more defective in expression than they are truthful. There is no doubt of that, observed Anselmo, anxious to support and uphold Lothario's ideas with Camilla, who was as regardless of his design as she was deep in love with Lothario, and so taking delight in anything that was his, and knowing what his thoughts and writings had her for her, their object, and that she herself was the real chorus, she asked him to repeat some other sonnet or verses if he recollected any. I do, replied Lothario, but I do not think it as good as the first one, or, more correctly speaking, was bad, but you can easily judge, for it is this. I know that I am doomed, death is to me, as certain as that thou, ungrateful fair, that at thy feet should see me lying ere. My heart repented of its love for thee, if buried in oblivion I should be, bereft of life, fame, favour, even there. It would be found that I thy image bear. Deep graven in my breast for all to see, this like some holy relic do I prize, to save me from the fate my truth entails, truth that to thy hard heart its vigor owes. Alas for him that under lowering skies in peril o'er trackless ocean sails, where neither friendly port nor pole star shows. 
Anselmo praised the second sonnet too, as he had praised the first, and so he went on adding link after link to the chain with which he was binding himself and making his dishonour secure. For when Lothario was doing most dishonour to him, he told him he was most honoured, and thus each step that Camilla descended towards the depths of her abasement, she mounted, in his opinion, toward the summit of virtue and fair fame. It so happened that, finding herself on one occasion alone with her maid, Camilla said to her, "'I am ashamed to think, my dear Leonella, how lightly, lightly I have valued myself that I did not compel Lothario to purchase, by at least some expenditure of time, that full possession of me that I so quickly yielded to him of my own free will. I fear that he will think ill my, my pliancy or lightness, not considering the irresistible influence he brought to bear upon me. "'Let not that trouble you, my lady,' said Leonella. For it does not take away the value of the thing given, or make it less precious to give it quickly, if it be really valuable and worthy of being prized. Nay, they are wont to say that he who gives quickly gives twice. They also say, said Camilla, that what costs little is valued less. That saying does not hold good in your case, replied Leonella, for love, as I have heard say, sometimes flies and sometimes walks. With this one it runs. With that it moves slowly, some it cools, others it burns, some it wounds, others it slays. It begins the course of its desires, and at the same moment completes and ends it. In the morning it will lay siege to a fortress, and by night will have taken it, for there is no power that can resist it. So what are you in dread of, what do you fear, when the same must have befallen Lothario, love hanging close, love having chosen the absence of my lord as the instrument for subduing you? And it was absolutely necessary to complete, then, what love has resolved upon, without affording the time to let Anselmo return, and by his presence compel the work to be left unfinished. For love has no better agent for carrying out his designs than opportunity, and of opportunity he avails himself in all his feats, especially at the outset. All this I know well myself, more by experience than by hearsay, and some day, Signora, I will enlighten you on the subject, for I am of your flesh and blood too. Moreover, Lady Camilla, you do not you did not surrender your surrender yourself, or yield so quickly, but that you that first you saw Lothario's whole soul in his eyes, in his sighs, in his words, his promises, and his gifts and by it and his good qualities perceived how worthy he was of your love. This, then, being the case, let not these scrupulous and prudish ideas trouble your imagination, but be assured that Lothario prizes you as you do him, and rest content and satisfied that as you are caught in the noose of love, it is one of worth and merit that has taken you, and one that has not only the four S's, that they say true lovers ought to have, but a complete alphabet. Only listen to me, and you will see how I can repeat it by rote. He is to my eyes and thinking, Amiable, brave, courteous, distinguished, elegant, fond, gay, honourable, illustrious, loyal, manly, noble, open, polite, quick-witted, rich, and the yeses according to the saying, and then tender, voracious, x does not suit him, for it is a rough letter, y has been given already, and z, zealous for your honour. Camilla laughed at her maid's alphabet, and perceived her to be more experienced in love's affairs than she said, which she admitted, confessing to Camilla that she had love passages with a young man of good birth of the same city. Camilla was uneasy at this, dreading lest it might prove the means of endangering her honour, and asked whether her intrigue had gone beyond words, and she, with little shame and much effrontery, said it had, for certain it is that ladies' imprudences make servants shameless, who, when they see their mistresses make a false step, think nothing of going astray themselves or of its being known. All that Camilla could do was to entreat Lothario to say nothing about her doings to him, whom she called her lover, and to conduct her own affairs secretly, lest they should come to the knowledge of Anselmo or of Lothario. Leonella said she would, but kept her word in such a way that she confirmed Camilla's apprehension of losing her reputation through her means. For this abandoned and bold Leonella, as soon as she perceived that her mistress's demeanour was not what it was wont to be, had the audacity to introduce her lover into the house confident that even if her mistress saw him, she would not dare to expose him, for the sins of mistresses entail this mischief among them. They make themselves the slave of their own servants, and are obliged to hide their laxities and depravities, as was the case with Camilla, who, though she perceived, not once but many times, that Leonella was, in, was with her lover in some room of the house, not only did not dare to chide them, but afforded her opportunities for concealing him, and removed all difficulties, lest he should be seen by her husband. She was unable, however, to prevent him from being seen on one occasion, as he sallied forth at daybreak by Lothario, who, not knowing who he was, at first took him for a spectre, but as soon as he saw him hasten away, muffling his face with the cloak and concealing himself carefully and cautiously, 
He rejected this foolish idea and adopted another, which would have been the ruin of all had not Camilla found a remedy. It did not occur to Lothaire that this man he had seen issuing at such an untimely hour from Anselmo's house could have entered it on Leonella's account, nor did he remember there was such a person as Leonella. All he thought that was as Camilla had been light in yielding with him, so she had been with another. For this further penalty, this brings this woman's. For this further penalty, the erring woman's sin bring with it, and that her honour is distrusted even by him whose overtures and persuasions she has yielded, and he believes her to have surrendered more easily to others, and gives implicit credence to every suspicion that comes into his mind. All Lothario's good sense seems to have failed him at this juncture, all his prudent maxims escaped his memory, for without once reflecting rationally, and without more ado, his in, in his impatience and in the blindness of the jealous rage that gnawed his heart, and dying to revenge himself upon Camilla, who had done him no wrong, before Anselmo had risen, he hastened him, and said, No, Anselmo, that for several days past I have been struggling with myself, striving to withhold from thee what is no longer possible or right that I should conceal from thee. No, that Camilla's fortress has surrendered, and is ready to submit to my will. And if I have been slow to reveal this fact to thee, it was in order to see if there were some like caprice of hers, or if she sought to try me and ascertain if the love I began to make to her with thy permission was made with a serious intention. I thought, too, that if she were what she ought to be, and what we both believed her, would have ere this given the information of my addresses. But seeing that she delays, I believe the truth of the promise she has given me. The next time thou art absent from the house, she will grant me an interview in the closet where thy jewels are kept. And it was true that Camilla used to meet him there. But I do not wish thee to rush precipitately to take vengeance, for the sin is as yet only committed in intention, and Camilla's may change, perhaps, between this and the appointed time, and repentance spring up in its place. As hitherto thou hast always followed my advice wholly, or in part, follow and observe this that I will give thee now, so that without mistake, and with mature deliberation, thou mayest satisfy thyself as to what may see in the best course. Pretend to absent thyself for two or three days, as thou hast been wont to do on other occasions, and contrive to hide thyself in the closet. For the tapestries and other things there afford great facilities for thy concealment, and then thou wilt see with, thy own, with thine own eyes, and I with mine, what Camilla's purpose may be. And if it be a guilty one, which may be feared rather than expected, with silence, prudence, and discretion, thou canst thyself become the instrument of punishment for the wrong done thee. And Selma was amazed, and overwhelmed, and astounded at the words of Lothario, which came upon him at a time when he least expected to hear them. For he now looked upon Camilla as having triumphed over the pretended attacks of Lothario, and was beginning to enjoy the glory of her victory. He remained silent for a considerable time, looking on the ground with fixed gaze, and at length said, Thou hast behaved, Lothario, as I expected of thy friendship. I will follow thy advice in everything. Do as thou wilt, and keep this secret as thou seest it should be kept in circumstance so unlooked for. Lothario gave him his word, but after leaving him he repented altogether of what he had said to him, perceiving how foolishly he had acted, as he might have revenged himself upon Camilla in some less cruel and degrading way. He cursed his want of sense, condemned his hasty resolution, and knew not what course to take to undo the mischief or find some ready escape from it. At last he decided upon revealing all to Camilla, and, as there was no want of opportunity for doing so, he found her alone the same day, but she, as soon as she had the chance of speaking to him, said, Lothario, my friend, I must tell thee, I have a sorrow in my heart which fills it so it seems ready to burst, and it will be wonder if it does not, for the audacity of Leonella has now reached such a pitch that every night she conceals a gallant of hers in this house, and remains with him till morning at the expense of my reputation, inasmuch as it is open to any one to question it who may see him quitting my house at such unseasonable hours. But what distresses me is that I cannot punish or chide her, for her privity to our intrigue bridles my mouth and keeps me silent about hers, while I am dreading that some catastrophe will come of it. As Camilla said this, Lothario at first imagined it was some device to delude him into the idea that the man he had seen going out was Leonella's lover, not hers, but when he saw how she wept and suffered, and begged him to help her, he became convinced of the truth, and the conviction completed his confusion and remorse. However, he told Camilla not to distress herself, as he would take measures to put a stop to the insolence of Leonella. At the same time he told her what, driven by the fierce rage of jealousy, he had said to Anselmo, and how he had arranged to hide himself in the closet, that he might there see plainly how little she preserved her fidelity to him, and he entreated her to pardon 
for this madness and her advice as to how to repair it and escape safely from the intricate labyrinth in which his imprudence had involved him. Camilla was struck with alarm at hearing what Lothario had said, and with much anger and great good sense. She reproved him and rebuked his base design in the foolish and mischievous resolution he had made. But as woman has by nature a nimbler wit than man for good and for evil, though it is apt to fail when she sets herself deliberately to reason, Camilla on the spur of the moment thought of a way to remedy what was all appearance irre irremediable, and told Lothario to contrive that the next day Anselmo should conceal himself in the place he mentioned, for she hoped his from his concealment to obtain the means of their enjoying themselves for the future without any apprehension, and without revealing her purpose to him entirely, she charged him to be careful, as soon as Anselmo was concealed, to come to her when Leonella should call him, and to all she said to him to answer, as he would take as he would have answered had he not known that Anselmo was listening. Lothario pressed her to explain her intention fully, so that he might with more certainty and precaution take care to do what he saw to be needful. "'I tell you,' said Camilla, "'there is nothing to take care of except to answer me what I shall ask you.' For she did not ex wish to explain to him beforehand what she meant to do, fearing lest he should be unwilling to follow out an idea which seemed to her such a good one, and should try to devise some other less practicable plan. Lothario then retired, and the next day Anselmo, under pretense of going to his friend's country house, took his departure, and then returned to conceal himself, which he was able to do easily, as Camilla and Leonella took care to give him the opportunity. And so he placed himself in hiding in the statue of agitation, that it may be imagined he would feel, who expected to see the vitals of his honour laid bare before his feet, eyes, and found himself on the point of losing the supreme blessing he thought he possessed in his beloved Camilla. Having made sure of Anselmo's being in his hiding place, Camilla and Leonella entered the closet, and the instant she set foot within it, Camilla said with a deep sigh, "'Ah! Dear Leonella, would it not be better, before I do what I am unwilling, you should know, lest you should seek to prevent it, that you should take Anselmo's dagger that I have asked of you, and with it pierce this vile heart of mine? But no, there is no reason why I should suffer the punishment of another's fault. I will first know what it is that the bold licentious eyes of Lothario have seen in me that could have encouraged him to reveal to me a design so base as that which he has disclosed, regardless of his friend and of my honour. Go to the window, Leonella, and call him, for no doubt he is in the street waiting to carry out his vile project. But mine, cruel it may be, but honourable, shall be carried out first. Ah, signora, said the crafty Leonella, who knew her part, what is it you want to do with this dagger? Can it be that you want to take your own life or Lothario's? For whichever you mean to do, it will lead to the loss of your reputation and good name. It is better to dissemble your wrong, and not give this wicked man the chance of entering the house now and finding us alone. Consider, Signor, we are a weak woman, and he is a man, and determined, and as he comes with such a base purpose, blind and urged by passion, perhaps you can put yours into execution. He may do what will be worse for you than taking your life. I'll betide my master Anselmo for giving such authority in his house to this shameless fellow, and supposing you kill him, Signor, as I suspect you mean to do. "'What shall we do with him when he is dead?' "'What, my friend?' replied Camilla. "'We shall leave him for Anselmo to bury him, "'for in reason it will be to him a light labour "'to hide his own infamy underground. "'Summon him, make haste, for all the time "'I delay in taking vengeance for my wrong "'seems to me an offence against the loyalty "'I owe my husband.' "'Anselmo was listening to all this, "'and every word that Camilla uttered "'made him change his mind, but when he heard "'that it was resolved to kill Lothario, "'his first impulse was to come out and show himself "'to avert such a disaster.' But in his anxiety to see the issue of a resolution so bold and virtuous, he restrained himself, and sending to come forth to prevent the deed in time. At this moment Camilla, throwing herself upon a bed that was close by, swooned away, and Leonella began to weep bitterly, exclaiming, "'Woe is me that I should be fated to have dying here in my arms the flower of virtue upon earth, the crown of true wives, the pattern of chastity, with more to the same effect, so that anyone who heard her would have taken her from the most tender-hearted and faithful handmaid in the world.' and her mistress for another persecuted Penelope. Camilla was not long in recovering from her fainting fit, and on coming to herself she said, "'Why do you not go, Leonella, to call hither that friend, the falsest to his friend, that the, the, the sun ever shone upon, or night concealed? Away, run, haste, speed, lest the fire of my wrath burn itself out with delay, and the righteous vengeance that I hope for melt away in venices and maledictions.' "'I am just going to call him, Signora," said Leonella, "'but first you must give me that dagger, "'lest while I am gone you should by means of it "'give cause to all who love you to weep all their lives.' 
own peace dear Le leonella i will not do so said camilla for rash and foolish as i may be to your mind in defending my honour i am not going to be so much as that lucretia who they say killed herself without having done anything wrong without having first killed him on whom the ground of her misfortune lay i shall die if i am to die but it must be after full vengeance upon him who has brought me here to weep over audacity that has that no fault of mine gave birth to leonella required much pressing before she would go to summon Lothario, but at last she went and while awaiting her return camilla continued as if speaking to herself good god would it not have been more prudent to have repulsed Lothario, as i have done many a time before than to allow him as i am now doing to think me unchaste and vile even for the short time i must wait until i undeceive him no doubt it would have been better but i should not be avenged nor the honour of my husband vindicated should he find so clear and easy an escape from the strait into which his depravity has led him let the traitor pay with his life for the temerity of his wanton wishes and let the world know if haply it shall ever come to know that camilla not only preserved her allegiance to her husband but avenged him of the man who dared to wrong him still i think it might be better to disclose this to anselmo but then i have called his attention to it in the letter i wrote him in the country and if he did nothing to prevent the mischief i there pointed out to him i suppose it was from pure goodness of heart and trustfulness he would not and could not believe that any thought against his honour could harbour in the breasts of so staunch a friend nor indeed did i myself believe it for many days nor should i have ever believed it if his insolence had not gone so far as to make manifest by open presence lavish promises and ceaseless tears but why do i argue this does a bold determination stand in need of arguments surely not and traitors avaunt vengeance to my aid let the false one come approach advance die yield up his life and then befall what may pure i came to him who heaven bestowed upon me pure i shall leave him and at the worst bathed in my own chaste blood and in the foul blood of the falsest friend that friendship ever saw in the world and as she uttered these words she paced the room holding the unsheathed dagger with such irregular and disordered steps and such gestures that one would have supposed her to have lost her senses and taken her for some violent desperado instead of a delicate woman and selmo hidden behind some tapestries where he had concealed himself beheld and was amazed by all and already felt that what he had seen and heard was a sufficient answer to even greater suspicions and he would have been now well pleased if the proof afforded by lothario's coming were dispensed with as he feared some sudden mishap but as he was on the point of showing himself and coming forth to embrace and undeceive his wife he paused as he saw leonella returning leading lothario camilla when she saw him drawing a long line in front of her on the floor with the dagger said to him lothario pay attention to what i say to thee if by any chance thou darest to cross this line thou seest or even approaches it the instant i see thee attempt it that same instant will i pierce my bosom with this dagger that i hold in my hand and before thou answerest me a word desire thee to listen to a few from me and afterwards thou shalt reply as may please thee first i desire to tell thee to tell me lothario if thou knowest my husband anselmo and in what light thou regardest him and secondly i desire to know if thou knowest me too answer me this without embarrassment or reflecting deeply what thou wilt answer for they are no riddles i put to thee lothario was not so dull but that from the first instance when camilla directed him to make anselmo hide himself he understood what she intended to do and therefore he fell in with her eyes idea so readily and promptly that between them they made the imposture look more true than truth so he answered her thus i did not think fair camilla that thou wert calling me to ask me questions that remote from the object with which i come but if it is to defer the promised reward thou art doing so thou might have put it off still longer for the ha longing for happiness gives the more distress and nearer comes the hope of gaining it for lest thou should say that i do not answer thy questions i say that i know thy husband anselmo and that we have known each other from our earliest years i will not speak of what thou too knowest of our friendship that i may compel not compel myself to testify against the wrong that love the mighty excuse for greater errors makes me inflict upon him thee i know and hold in the same estimation as he does for were it not so i had not for a lesser prize acted in opposition to what i owe my station and the holy laws of true friendship now broken and violated by me through that powerful enemy love if thou dost confess that returned camilla mortal enemy of all that rightly deserves to be loved with what face dost thou dare to come before one who thou knowest to be the mirror wherein he is reflected on whom thou shouldst look to see how unworthily thou him but woe is me i now comprehend what has made thee give so little heed to what thou owest to thyself 
it must have been some freedom of mine for i will not call it a modesty as it did not proceed from any deliberate intention but from some heedlessness such as women are guilty of through inadvertence when they have no occasion for reserve but tell me traitor when did i by word or sign give a reply to thy prayers that could awaken in thee a shadow of hope of attaining thy base wishes when were not thy professions of love sternly and scornfully rejected and rebuked when were thy frequent pledges and still more frequent gifts believed or accepted but as i am persuaded that no one can long persevere in the attempt to win love unsustained by some hope i am willing to attribute to myself the blame of thy assurance for no doubt some thoughtless thoughtlessness of mine has all this time fostered thy hopes and therefore will i punish myself and inflict upon myself the penalty thy guilt deserves and that thou mayest see that being so relentless to myself i cannot possibly be otherwise to thee i have summoned thee to be a witness of the sacrifice i mean to offer to the injured honour of my honoured husband wronged by thee with all the assiduity thou wert capable and by me too the want of caution in avoiding every occasion if i have given any of encouraging and sanctioning thy base designs once more i say that suspicion in my mind that some imprudence of mine has engendered these lawless thoughts in thee is what causes me most distress and what i desire to punish with my own hands for were any other instrument of punishment employed my error might become what causes me distress and what i desire my error might become widely known but before i do so in my death i mean to inflict death and take with me one that will satisfy my longing for the revenge i hope for and have for i shall see wheresoever it may be that i go the penalty awarded by inflexible unswerving justice on him who has placed me in a position so desperate as she uttered these words with words with incredible energy and swiftness she flew upon lothario with a naked dagger so manifestly burnt on burying it in his breast that he was almost uncertain whether these demonstrations were real or feigned for he was obliged to have recourse to all his skill and strength to prevent her from striking him and with such reality did she act at this strange farce and mystification that to give it a colour of truth she determined to stain it with her own blood for perceiving or pretending that she could not wound lothario she said fate it seems will not grant my desire complete satisfaction but it will not be able to keep me from satisfying it partially at least and making an effort to free the hand with a dagger which lothario held in his grasp she released it and directing the point to a place where it could not inflict a deep wound she plunged it into her left side high up close to the shoulder and then allowed herself to fall to the ground as if in a faint Leonel and lothario stood amazed and astounded at the catastrophe and seeing camilla stretched on the ground and bathed in her blood they were still uncertain as to the true nature of the act lothario terrified and breathless ran in haste to pluck out the dagger but when he saw how slight the wound was he relieved of his fears that once more admired the subtlety coolness and ready wit of the fair camilla and the better to support the part he had been he had to play he began to utter profuse doleful lamentations over her body as if she were dead invoking maledictions not only on himself but also on him who had been the means of placing him in such a position and knowing that his friend Anselmo heard him, he spoke in such a way as to make a listener feel much more pity for him than for Camilla, even though he supposed her dead. Leonella took her up in her arms and laid her on the bed, entreating Lothario to go in quest of someone to attend to her wound in secret, and at the same time asking his advice and opinion as to what they should say to Anselmo about his lady's wound if he should chance to return before it was healed. He replied they might say what they liked, for he was not in a state to give advice that would be of any use. All he could tell her was to try and stanch the blood, as he was going where he should never more be seen, and with every appearance of deep grief and sorrow he left the house. But when he found himself alone, and where there was nobody to see him, he crossed himself unceasingly, lost in wonder at the adroitness of Camilla, and the consistent acting of Leonella. He reflected how convinced Anselmo would be that he had a second port portia for a wife, and he looked forward anxiously to meeting him in order to rejoice together over falsehood and truth the most craftily veiled that could be imagined leonella as he told her stanched her lady's blood which was no more than suffice to support her deception and washing the wound with a little wine she bound it up to the best of her school skill taking all the time she was sending her in a strain that even if nothing else had been said before would have been enough to assure anselmo that he had in camilla a model of purity to leonella's word camilla added her own calling herself cowardly and wanting in spirit since she had not at the time she had most need of it to rid herself of the life she so much loathed. She asked her attendant's advice as to whether or not she ought to inform her beloved husband of all that had happened. 
but the other bade her to say nothing about it as she would lay upon him the obligation of taking vengeance on lothario which he could not do but at great risk to himself and it was the duty of a true wife not to give her husband provocation to quarrel but on the contrary to remove it as far as possible from him camilla replied that she believed she was right and that she would follow her advice but at any rate it would be well to consider how she was to explain the wound to anselmo for he could not help seeing it to which leonella answered that she did not know how to tell a lie even in jest how then can i know my dear said camilla for i should not dare to forge or keep up a falsehood if my life depended on it if we can think of no escape from the difficulty it will be better to tell him the plain truth than he should find us out in an untrue story be not uneasy senora said leonella between this and to-morrow i will think of that which we must say to him and perhaps the wound being where it is can be hidden from sight and heaven will be pleasured to aid us in a porpoise so good and honourable compose yourself senora and endeavour to calm your excitement lest my lord find you agitated and leave the rest to my care and god's who always supports good intentions anselmo had with the deepest attention listened to and seen played out the tragedy of the death of his honour which the performers acted with such wonderfully effective truth that it seemed as if they had become the realities of the parts they played he longed for night and an opportunity of escaping from the house to go and see his good friend lothario and with him give vent to his joy over the precious pearl he had gained in having established his wife's purity both mistress and maid took care to leave him an opportunity to give him time and opportunity to get away and taking advantage of it he made his escape and at once he went in quest of lothario and it would be impossible to describe how he embraced him when he found him and the things he said to him in the joy of his heart and the praises he bestowed upon camilla all which lothario listened to without being able to show any pleasure for he could not forget how deceived his friend was and how dishonourably he had wronged him and though anselmo could see that lothario was not glad still he imagined it was only because he had left camilla wounded and had himself been the cause of it and so among other things he told himself not to be distressed about camilla's accident for as they had agreed to hide it from him the wound was evidently trifling and that being so he had no cause for fear but should henceforward be of good cheer and rejoice with him seeing that by his means and adroitness he found himself raised to the greatest height of happiness that he could venture to hope for and desired no better pastime than making verses in praise of camilla that would preserve her name for all time to come lothario commended his purpose and promised on his own part to aid him in raising a monument so glorious and so anselmo was left the most charmingly hoodwinked man there could be in the world he himself persuaded he was conducting the instrument of his glory led home by the hand him who had been the utter destruction of his good name whom camilla received with averted countenance though with smiles in her heart the deception was carried on for some time until at the end of the few months fortune turned her wheel and the guilt which had been until then so skilfully concealed was published abroad and then Selmo paid with his life the penalty of his ill-advised curiosity. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 Which treats of the heroic and prodigious battle Don Quixote had with certain skins of red wine, and brings the novel of the ill-advised curiosity to a close. There remained but little more of the novel to be read when Sancho Panza burst forth in wild excitement from the garret where Don Quixote was lying, shouting, run sirs quick and help my master who is in the thick of the toughest and stiffest battle i have ever laid eyes on by the living god he has given the giant the enemy of the lady princess mikomikona such a slash that he has sliced his head clean off as it were a turnip what are you talking about brother said the curate pausing as he was about to read the remainder of the novel are you in your senses sancho how the devil can it be as you say when the giant is two thousand leagues away here they heard a loud noise in the chamber and don quixote shouting stand thief brigand villain now have i got thee and thy scimitar shall not avail thee and then it seemed as though he were slashing vigorously at the wall don't stop to listen said San sancho but go in and part them or help my master though there is no need of that now for no doubt the giant is dead by this time and giving account to god of his wicked past life for i saw the blood flowing on the ground and the head cut off and fallen on one side and it is as big as a large wineskin may i die said the landlord at this if don quixote or don devil has not been slashing some of the skins of red wine that stand full at his bed's head and the spilt wine must be what his good fellow takes for blood and so saying he went into his room and the rest after him and there they found don quixote in the strangest costume in the world he was in his shirt which was not long enough in front to cover his thighs completely 
and was six fingers shorter behind. His legs were very long and lean, covered with hair, and anything but clean. On his head he had a little greasy red cap that belonged to the host. Round his arm he had rolled the blanket of the bed to which Sancho, for reasons best known to himself, owed a grudge, and in his right hand he held his unsheathed sword, with which he was slashing about on all sides, uttering exclamations as if he were actually fighting some giant, and the best of it was his eyes were not open, for he was fast asleep, and dreaming that he was doing battle with a giant. For his imagination was so wrought upon by the adventure he was going to accomplish that it made him dream he had already reached the kingdom of my comic and was engaged in combat with his enemy, and believing he was laying on the giant, he had given so many sword-cuts to the skin that the whole room was full of wine. On seeing this, the landlord was so enraged that he fell on Don Quixote, and with his clenched fists began to pummel him in such a way that if Cardinio and the curate had not dragged him off, he would have brought the war of the giant to an end. But in spite of all, the poor gentleman never woke until the barber brought a great pot of cold water from the well and flung it with one dash all over his body, on which Don Quixote woke up, but not so completely as to understand what was the matter. Dorothea, seeing how short and slight his attire was, would not go in to witness the battle between her champion and her opponent. As for Sancho, he went searching all over the floor for the head of the giant, and not finding it, he said, "'I see now that it's all enchantment in this house, for the last time, on this very spot where I am now. I got ever so many thumps without knowing who gave them to me, or being able to see anybody, and now this head is not to be seen anywhere about, though I saw it cut off with my own eyes, and the blood running from the body as if from a fountain.' "'What blood and fountains are you talking about, enemy of God and his saints?' said the landlord. "'Don't you see, you thief, that the blood and the fountain are only these skins that have been stabbed in the red wine swimming all over the room? And I wish I saw the soul of him that stabbed them swimming in hell.' "'I know nothing about that,' said Sancho. "'All I know is that it will be bad luck that through not finding his, this head my country will melt away like salt in water.' For Sancho awake was worse than his master's sleep so much his master's promises addled his wits. The landlord was beside himself at the coolness of the squire and the mischievous doings of the master, and swore it should not be like the last time when they went without paying, and that their privileges of chivalry should not good hold good this time to let one or the other of them without paying, even to the cost of the plugs that would have to be put to the dead wineskins. The curate was holding Don Quixote's hands, who, fancying he had now ended the adventure, and was in the presence of the princess Mycomicona, knelt before the curate and said, "'Exalted and beauteous lady, your highness may live from this day forth, fearless of any harm this base being could do you, and I too from this day forth am released from the promise I gave you, since by the help of God on high and by the favour of her by whom I live and breathe I have fulfilled it so successfully.' "'Did not I say so?' said Sancho on hearing this. "'You see, I wasn't drunk, and there, you see, my master has already salted the giant. "'There's no doubt about the balls. My country is all right.' "'Who could have helped laughing at the absurdities of the pair, master and man? "'And laugh they did, all except the landlord, who cursed himself. "'But at length the barber, Cardinio, and the curate contrived with no small trouble to get Don Quixote on the bed. "'And he fell asleep with every appearance of excessive weariness.' They left him to sleep, and came out to the gate of the inn to console Sancho Panza for not having found the head of the giant, but much more work had they to appease the landlord, who was furious at the sudden death of his wineskins, and said the landlady, half scolding, half crying, at an evil moment, and in such an unlucky hour he came into the, my house, this knight errant, would that I had never set eyes on him, for dear he has cost me. The last time he went off with the overnight score against him for supper, bed, straw, and barley, for himself and squire and a hack and an ass, saying he was a knight adventurer. God sent unlucky adventures to him and all the adventurers in the world, and therefore not bound to pay anything, for it was so settled by the knight errantry tariff. And then, all because of him, came the other gentleman and carried off my tail, and gives it back more than two curatillas the worse, all stripped of its hair, so that it is not for my husband's purpose, and then, for a finishing touch to all, to burst my wineskins and spill my wine. I wish I saw his own blood spilt, but let him not deceive himself, for by the bones of my father and the shade of my mother they shall pay me down every quartz. My name is not what it is, and I am not my father's daughter. All this and more to the same effect the landlady delivered with great irritation, and her good maid Meritornes backed her up, while the daughter held her peace and smiled from time to time. The curate smoothed matters by promising to make good all losses to the best of his power. 
not only as regarded the wine-skin, but also the wine, and above all the depreciation of the tale which they set such store by. Dorothea comforted Sancho, telling him that she pledged herself as soon as it should appear certain that his master had decapitated the giant, and she found herself peacefully established in her kingdom, to bestow upon him the best county there was in it. With this Sancho consoled himself, and assured the princess she might rely upon it that he had seen the head of the giant, and more by token it had a beard that reached to the girdle, and that if it was not to be seen now it was because everything that happened in that house went by enchantment, as he himself had proved the last time he had lodged there. Dorothea said that she fully believed it, and that he need not be uneasy, for all would go well and turn out as he wished. And therefore, being appeased, the curate was anxious to go on with the novel, as he saw there was but little more left to read. Dorothea and the others begged him to finish it, and he, as he was willing to please them, and enjoyed reading it himself, continued the tale in these words. The result was that from the confidence Anselmo felt in Camilla's virtue, he lived happily and free from anxiety, and Mila purposely looked coldly on Lothario, that Anselmo might suppose her feelings towards him to be the opposite of what they were, and the better to support the position, Lothario begged to be excused from coming to the house, as the displeasure with which Camilla regarded his presence was plain to be seen. But the befooled Anselmo said he would on no account allow such a thing, and so in a thousand ways became the author of his own dishonour, while he believed he was ensuring his happiness. Meanwhile the satisfaction with which Leonella saw herself in power to carry on her amour reached such a height that regardless of everything else she followed her, in her inclinations unrestrainedly, feeling confident that her mistress would screen her and even show her how to manage it safely. At last one night Anselmo heard footsteps in Leonella's room, and on trying to enter to see who it was he found that the door was held against him, which made him all the more determined to open it and exerting his strength he forced it open and entered the room in time to see a man leaping through the window into the street he ran quickly to seize him or discover who he was but he was unable to effect either purpose for leonella flung her arms round him crying be calm signor do not give way to passion or follow him who has escaped from this he belongs to me and in fact he is my husband and selma would not believe it but blind with rage he drew a dragger and threatened to stab leonella bidding her to tell her the truth or he would kill her she in fear, not knowing what she was saying, exclaimed, "'Do not, do not kill me, Signor, for I can tell you more th important things than any you can imagine.' "'Tell me, then, at once, or thou diest,' said Anselmo. "'It would be impossible for me now,' said Leonella. "'I am so agitated. Leave me till to-morrow, and then you shall hear from me what thou will fill thou with astonishment. But rest assured that he who leaped through the windows is the young man of this city, who has given me his promise to become my husband.' And Selma was appeased with this, and was content to wait the time she asked of him, for he never expected to hear anything against Camilla, so satisfied and sure of her virtue was he, and so he quitted the room and left Leonella locked in, telling her she should not come out until she had told him all she had to make known to him. He went at once to Cam see Camilla, and tell her, as he did, all that passed between him and her handymaid, and the promise she had given to inform him of matters of serious importance. There is no saying whether Camilla was agitated or not, for so great was her fear and dismay that making sure, as she had good reason to do, that Leonella would tell Anselmo all she knew of her faithlessness, she had not the courage to wait and see if her suspicions were confirmed, and that same night, as soon as she thought that Anselmo was asleep, she packed up the most valuable jewels she had and some money, without being observed by anybody, escaped the, from the house, and betook herself to Lotharius, to whom she related what had occurred, imploring him to convey her some to some place of safety, or to fly with her, where they might be safe from Anselmo. The state of perplexity to which Camilla reduced Lothario was such that he was unable to utter a word in reply, still less to decide upon what he should do. At length he resolved to conduct her to a convent to which a sister of his was prioress. Camilla agreed to this, and with the speed which the circumstances demanded, Lothario took her to the convent and left her there, and then himself quitted the city without letting any one know of his departure. As soon as daylight came, Anselmo, without missing Camilla from his side, rose, eager to learn what Leonella had to tell him, and hastened to the room where he had locked her in. He entered, he opened the door, but found no Leonella. All he found was some sheets knotted to the window, a plain proof that she had let herself down from it and escaped. He returned uneasily to tell Camilla, but not finding her in bed or anywhere in the house, he was lost in amazement. He asked servants of the house about her, but none of them could give him any explanation. As he was going in search of Camilla, it happened by chance that he observed her boxes were lying open, and that the greater part of her jewels were gone, and now he became fully aware of his disgrace, and that Leonella was not the cause of his misfortune, 
and just as he was, without delaying to dress himself completely, he repaired, sat at heart and dejected, to his friend Lothario to make known his sorrow to him. But when he fell to find him, and his servants reported that he had been absent from his house all night, and had taken with him all the money he had, he felt as though he were losing his senses, and to make all complete on returning to his own house, he found it deserted and empty, not one of all his servants, male or female, remaining in it. He knew not what to think, or say, or do, and his reason seemed to be deserting him little by little. He reviewed his position, and saw himself in a moment left without wife, friend, or servants, abandoned, he felt, by the heavens above him, and more than all robbed of his honour, for in Camilla's disappearance he saw his own ruin. After long reflection he resolved at last to go to his friend's village, where he had been staying when he afforded opportunities for the contrivance of this complication of misfortune. He had locked the doors of his house, mounted his horse, and with a broken spirit sent out on his journey. But he had hardly gone half-way, when, harassed by his reflections, he had to dismount and tie his horse to a tree, and at the foot of which he threw himself, giving vent to piteous heart-rending sighs, and there he remained till nearly nightfall, when he observed a man approaching on horseback from the city, of whom, after saluting him, he asked what was the news in Florence. The citizen replied, The strangest that have been heard for many a day, for it is reported abroad that Lothario, a great friend of the wealthy Anselmo, who lived at San Giovanni, carried off last night Camilla, the wife of Anselmo, who also has disappeared. All this has been told by a maid servant of Camilla's, whom the governor found last night, lowering herself by a sheet from the windows of Anselmo's house. I know not indeed precisely how the affair came to pass. All I know is that the whole city is wondering at the occurrence, for no one could have expected a thing of the kind, seeing the great and intimate friendship that existed between them, so great, they say, that they were called the two friends. Is it known at all, said Anselmo, what road Lothario and Camilla took? Not in the least, said the citizen, though the governor has been very active in searching for them. God speed you, senor, said Anselmo. God be with you, said the citizen, and went on his way. This disastrous intelligence almost robbed Anselmo not only of his senses, but of his life. He got up as well as he was able, and reached the house of his friend, who as yet knew nothing of his misfortune, but seeing him come pale, worn, and haggard, perceived that he was suffering some heavy affliction. Anselmo at once begged to be allowed to retire to rest, and to be given writing materials. His wish was complied with, and he was left lying down and alone, for he desired this, and even that the door should be locked. Finding himself alone, so he took to heart the thought of his misfortune, that by the signs of death he felt within him, he knew well his life was drawing to a close, and therefore he resolved to leave behind him a declaration of the cause of his strange end. He began to write, but there, before he had put down all he meant to say, his breath failed him, and he yielded up his life, a victim to the suffering which his ill-advised curiosity had entailed upon him. The master of the house, observing that it was now late, and that Anselmo did not call, determined to go in and ascertain if his dis in disposition was increasing, and found him lying on his face, his body partly in bed, partly on the writing-table, on which he lay with the written paper open and the pen still in his hand. Having first called him without receiving any answer, his host approached him, and, taking him by the hand, found that it was cold, and saw that he was dead. Greatly surprised and distressed, he summoned the household to witness the sad fate which had befallen Anselmo, and then he read the paper, the handwriting of which he recognized as his, and which contained these words, A fool and ill-advised desire has robbed me of life. If the news of my death should reach there's a Camilla, let her know that I forgive her, for she was not bound to perform miracles, nor ought I to have required her to perform them, and since I have been the author of my own dishonor, there is no reason why— so far Anselmo had written, and thus it was plain that at this point, before he could finish what he had to say, his life came to an end. The next day his friend sent intelligence of his death to his relatives, who had already ascertained his misfortune, as well as the convent where Camilla lay almost on the point of accompanying her husband to that inevitable journey, not on account of the tidings of his death, but because of those she received of her lover's departure. Although she saw herself a widow, it is said she refused either to quit the convent or to take the veil, until not at long afterwards, intelligence reached her that Lothario had been killed in a battle in which Monsieur de Lautrec had been recently engaged with the great Captain Gonzalo Fernandez de Cordova in the kingdom of Naples, whither her too late repentant lover had repaired. On learning this, Camilla took the veil, and shortly afterwards died, worn out by grief and melancholy. This was the end of all three, an end that came of a thoughtless beginning. "'I like this novel,' said the curate." but I cannot persuade myself of its truth, and it has been invented. The author's invention is faulty, for it is impossible to imagine any husband so foolish as to try such a costly experiment as Anselmo's. 
If it had been represented as occurring between a gallant and his mistress, it might pass. But between husband and wife, there is something of an impossibility about it. As to the way in which the story is told, however, I find I have no fault to find. End of chapter 35 End of chapter 34 through 35